Now, Ukimene is translated better as... You might have heard this verse the way I did growing up. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. This is the missionary verse. This is the verse that says uh, we need to support the missionaries on the field. The way I imagined it as a child is that someday uh, in, in the Amazon jungle they'll play the Jesus film for the last pygmy tribe. So spelar de där för den sista pygmeerstammen. And when the last pygmy hears the gospel. Och när den sista pygmeen hör Jesus hör evangelium. Then the end will come. Då kommer slutet. Everybody on the planet just has to hear the gospel presented one time. Alla på hela planeten bara behöver höra evangelium presenterat en gång. And when that magic moment happens, then we'll get raptured. Did you have something similar in your head? There's a couple challenging thoughts though. What if the last pygmy is watching the video? Men om det nu är så att sista pygmen tittar på en video But then another pygmy is born Men så föds den en liten pygmen Or, or does it have to do with uh, the pygmy has to be a certain age the age of accountability Eller måste det vara så här pygmen måste ha en speciell eh, ålder där inne så att han liksom kan räntas med och ha ett ansvar So maybe one of them turns five right after the video plays. So no play bar precis fem rock efter det att man har spelat den här video. So where's the line, right? Var går gränsen? I do believe that we are to spread the kingdom and keep preaching the gospel. Jag tror att vi måste fortsätta utreda riket och fortsätta predika med Jesus. But I can't use this verse to motivate that. Men jag kan inte använda den här versen för att motivera det. And here's why. Det här är varför. It says in our translation. Det står i vår översättning. It will be preached in the whole world. Det står att det ska predikas i hela världen. But it doesn't say whole world. Det står inte hela världen. It's a Greek word, ukimene. Det är det grekiska ordet ukimene. And it's the same word used in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Det är samma ord som är i Lukas 2, vers 1. Now that's part of the Christmas story. Det är ju en del av julevangeliet. It said that Caesar Augustus sent out a decree. Det står att Augustus skickar ut ett påbud. That a census would be taken of the whole world. There were no Aztecs involved in that. Do you know what an Aztec is? Aztec. Probably no Swedes. <laughs> The Ukimene is, is not the whole planet. 
We talked about the whole planet earlier. Vi talade om hela planeten tidigare. That's the word cosmos. Det är ordet kosmos. He doesn't say the gospel will be preached to the cosmos. Det står inte att evangeliet ska förkunnas till kosmos. He says the whole Ukimene will receive the gospel. Det står att hela Ukimene kommer att ta emot evangeliet. Now Ukimene is translated better as the civilized world. Och Ukimene översätts bättre som den civiliserade världen. So to be more accurate, it would be the whole Roman Empire. Which is also what received the census. So we also have evidence in Paul's letters. That he believed att han trodde that they had reached the whole Roman Empire. Att de tro, att de hade nått hela romerska riket. In Romans chapter 1 verse 8. I Romarbrevet 1 8. He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being recorded all over the world. Så så här jag tackar alltså min Gud genom Jesus Kristus för alla. Därför att man i hela världen talar om det tror. And the word he uses is actually cosmos. Och det ordet han använder här är faktiskt kosmos. So he's really optimistic. Han är väldigt optimistisk. And he says in Romans 10 verse 18. Och i Roma brevet 10 vers 18. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. Och där citerar han gamla testamentet. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Men då frågar jag, kanske har de aldrig hört det? Visst har de det. Över hela jorden nådde deras röst. Det är världens enda deras ord. So Paul really seems to believe that they have gone out to the whole world. Så Paulus verkar verkligen tro att de har nått ut i hela världen. He says it even clearer in Colossians chapter 1. In verse 6. Och i vers 6. He says in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Evangeliet som har nått fram till er liksom det bär flut och växer till i hela världen. Så har det gjort och ser ända sedan dag då vi först började och fick kunskap om Guds nåd sådana verkligheter. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Evangeliet bär frukt och växer till i hela världen. And the word he says here is cosmos. Och det ordet världen här and he says it one more time in verse 23 this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I Paul have become a servant Fått höra om i evangeliet som har förkunnats för allt skapat om det inte och vad känner jag Paulus har blivit. Så so Jesus säger i Matteus 24, vers 14. Så Jesus säger i Matteus 24, vers 14. And this gospel of the kingdom. Att det här eh, evangeliet om riket will be preached throughout the Roman Empire as a testimony to all ethnicities and then the end will come. And Paul says in four different passages the gospel has gone out to the whole cosmos. 
and is bearing fruit everywhere. Och bär fruit överallt. The spread of Christianity in that first 40 years was throughout the entire Roman Empire and farther. We know of, of Thomas who went all the way over to India and there were other apostles that went down into Africa such as into Ethiopia Och vi vet att det fanns andra apostlar som åkte till Afrika och så ner till Etiopien. And that was all before 70 AD. Och det var allt innan 70 före Kristus, efter Kristus. So this was extreme growth. Så det var en extrem tillväxt. Then verse 15. Vers 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now we covered this one earlier, so you understand that already. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. That is one verse that's very important. Because I've heard some of the saddest stories because of that verse. There are so many young ladies that I've met who are afraid to have children because of that verse. I think that is one of the motivating verses for me. To help see young women get free. From the fear with that verse. You don't have to be afraid of this verse, ladies. You don't have to be afraid of this verse, ladies. Some of you, I, I just want to see that lift off of you. There's a parallel to that verse. Where Jesus says in Luke 23. Verse uh, 28. Um, it's actually, it, I, I wouldn't call it a parallel, sorry. This is when Jesus is uh, walking to the cross. And Simon is helping carry the cross. And in Luke 23, verse 28, Jesus turns to some women who are crying for him. And he he says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that have never born and the breasts that have never nursed. Now, he's on his way to get crucified. Don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. Because you are going to go through the real problem here. You're going to go through something horrendous. 
Oh, that's a super scary thing eh, to hear. Eh, som man blir rädd av att höra. You're standing there crying for Jesus. Du står där och gråter över Jesus. And he turns to you and says that. Du vänder han sig mot dig och säger han detta. He is not talking to women 2,000 years later. Han talar inte till kvinnor 2,000 år senare. He's talking to the scared women right in front of him. Han talar till dem because he knows what's coming and they don't now hopefully they listen to him and escape the destruction but it's important that we understand he wasn't talking to us so back in Matthew 24, <laughs> verse 20, <laughs> pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. <laughs> now in Acts chapter 1, <laughs> In verse 12, verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. A Sabbath day's walk. So he, he says to pray that it wouldn't happen on the Sabbath. And they had a thing called the Sabbath day's walk. Which is about one kilometer. So if you walk more than one kilometer on the Sabbath, and somebody were to report you, the temple police would show up and put you in jail. Because you're violating a temple law. So if the city is about to be destroyed, and you live more than one kilometer from the wall, you might, you might not make it to the wall. <coughs> if it's the Sabbath. So you need to have it one of the other days of the week. If you walked more than one kilometer, you had to sit down for two hours. If you walked more than one kilometer, it was considered working on the Sabbath. So you don't want to have to sit down every two hours when the Romans are coming. You're not even supposed to go down and get your coat. You're not supposed to go down from the rooftop. You're supposed to go from rooftop to rooftop to get out of that city. Verse 21. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. We're going to say that this is the beginning of the world. That scribbly circle is the world. So, never from the beginning of the world until now. And never to be equaled again. 
2018. The way that he says it is not about the end of human history. He drops it into human history. Since the beginning of the world and will never be equaled again. Now how is this the worst thing ever? We can look at other wars where more people died. Even World War II where more Jewish people died. Now in the destruction of Jerusalem there was 1.1 million Jewish people that died. Which is terrible. But it's not as many as World War II with estimates of 6 million. Or many more if you factor in Stalin. Stalin. So how is it the worst thing that's ever happened? If we're just going by numbers, it, it isn't. But for the Jewish people, from the beginning of their world, until 70 AD, what happens here is the worst thing ever. They lose their temple. They lose their priests. They lose their ability to do animal sacrifice. They lose their genealogical records. Which was very, very important to them as a culture. And those records would have been kept in the temple that got burned down. When you picture uh, Judaism nowadays, you are not seeing Old Testament Judaism. In the Old Testament, they gathered around the tabernacle or around the temple and there was animal sacrifice and there was a high priest and a priesthood system. Ju uh, Judaism today there's no temple there's no animal sacrifice there's no high priest they don't even call them priests now it's rabbinical Judaism where you gather in a little synagogue and you gather around your local rabbi the same way that a church gathers around a local pastor it is not the same religion as in the Old Testament because it's impossible for them to keep the religion that they had it moved from Mosaic Judaism to, to a system known as Rabbinical Judaism. It's a totally different religion. And we never noticed. Oh, we're switching up. Yeah. <laughs> Would someone like to take my place? <laughs> <laughs> Could be a, 
a challenge. Um, oh, it, so that was the greatest distress that they had ever experienced. So they were the best of them all was in the pit. And at least when they had been attacked by Babylon the first time, they were not able to attack the other Babylon the first time. They didn't lose their genealogical records. So they were not able to see the scriptures or the sign. And they were able to come back and rebuild their temple. They had the ability to come back and build the temple again. But now, 1900 years later, in 1900 years later, and they still have never got their temple back. So they have not been able to get back their temple. They've never got their genealogy back. Don't be kidding. The book of the past gift. Even even if you do the little pin prick and you mail it in with your blood for DNA testing, even if you do the DNA test with your blood, you could find out that you're Jewish. You can find out that you're Jewish, but you can't narrow down which of the twelve tribes you are. But it can be easily guessed down to the blood. So how will you be able to prove that you are 100% Levite? You can do the visa to your hundred percent Levite. And if you cannot prove that, you cannot be a priest. Or do you can be a visa to become a priest? So it's impossible to reestablish that system. So the umbo is a total shock for the system. So this is the worst thing that had ever happened. So that that was just a nonsense that happened. And nothing like it could ever happen. Och något annat sådant kan aldrig hända igen. Because it already happened. It can't be on the other hand. So can't be here. Let's continue. Foot foot. Verse twenty-two. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Hade inte den tiden förkortats skulle ingen människa bli frälst, men för de utvalda skull kommer den tiden att förkortas. Once they broke through the wall, när de gick igenom täcket, they took captive 90,000 Jewish people. Så de fångade upp 90,000 judar. Now they killed a lot more before they took them captive. De dödade många fler innan de tog dem till fångarna. Uh, and many times they would have killed everybody there because it was a rebellion. Ofta så hade man dödat alla rebeller. But there was something in Titus's heart that he stopped killing them. Men någonting i Titus hjärta gjorde att han slutade döda dem. And took those ninety and sent ninety thousand and sent them out as captives. Tog tog nitti tusen till fånga. Let's put this verse in perspective. Lägg vi den här versen i rätta perspektiv. If Titus had killed all of the Jewish people in Jerusalem, om Titus hade dödat alla judar i Jerusalem, next he would have turned to Mount Pella. Next, 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 he would have turned to Mount Pella. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Had the time been cut short, there would be no one to be saved. But for the outvalda skull, the time would be shortened. Verse twenty-three. At that time, if anyone says to you, "Look, here is the Messiah," or "There he is," do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders and miracles. To deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. Om någon då säger till er, här är Messias eller där är han, så tro det inte. Falska Messias i stallet och falska profeter ska träda fram, göra stora tecken och under för att om möjligt bedra även de utvalda. Jag har nu sagt det till er i förväg. We've covered the false prophets. It's, he's giving a similar warning again here. So if anyone tells you, "There he is out in the wilderness," do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Om de säger till er, han är i öknen, så gå inte dit. Eller han är i de inre rummen, så tro det inte. For as lightning comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. För som blixten går ut från öster och lyser ända bort i väster så ska det vara när människosåren kommer. 
It's very easy for our brain to switch back to futurism. Det är väldigt enkelt för vår hjärna att gå tillbaka till futurism. With a couple of these verses. Men några från den här. This one is easy to go back mentally. Det här verset är enkelt att gå tillbaka mentalt. And get all of our cartoon pictures of Jesus coming across the sky. Och få hela våra våra seriefigurer om Jesus som som kommer över huvudet. But remember that coming is coming in judgment. He's saying the coming judgment is going to be visible to all. So when you see those armies coming, see it's not just the Romans that are coming. If you remember the story of the bride and the, the wedding, it's, it says that the king was enraged and sent his armies. The king is the father. So the father is the one who is enraged at the vineyard keepers. So the father is the one who is upset about the, the wedding. So there's a combination of both the Romans are coming to judge Jerusalem. But Jesus is also bringing this judgment. This is what he said in Matthew 23. That all the judgment of from Abel to Zechariah will fall on their heads. And the Jewish people actually call it on themselves at Jesus' crucifixion. You remember Pilate, he washes his hands. He says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And the Jewish people yell out, let his blood be on our heads and on the heads of our children. Verse 28, wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. So here he pictures Jerusalem as a corpse. The vulture was the sign that was carried on the Roman army's banner. Now, Jerusalem is going to be filled with corpses. Jerusalem be filled with leak. And he says, basically, we're going to be one giant carcass. They'll say that people will be in this place. And the Roman banner is going to come surround us. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now you can notice that that's actually a quote. It probably shows you in your margin where that's from. Or several verses where it's from. Uh, mine says Isaiah chapter 13. And Isaiah chapter 34. But it's, it shows up in about seven or eight places in the Old Testament prophets. But if it's the idea of the heavens rolling up and stars falling from the sky was a prophetic way of declaring the destruction of a city. We see this because the Old Testament prophets when they talk about the destruction of Edom, they use the same language. When they declare the judgment of Jerusalem under Babylon, 
they use the same language. When they declare the judgment of Egypt, they use the same language. It was understood as the destruction of a city. If we were to read this literally, instead of prophetic symbolism, that's where the chapter should end. Because you can't have anything else after the sun is darkened and stars fall from the sky. That is the end of the planet. But that's not what he's saying. He's talking about local government. You remember Joseph had a dream? And in the dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars bowed down to him. And he understood that that was his siblings, his brothers, and his parents. Which in his family would be the government. So these uh, sun, moon, and stars have to do with a government. So sol och måne och stjärna måste ju ha något med styre att göra. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one heaven, one end of the heavens to the other. Då ska människosonens tecken synas på himlen och jordens alla folk ska jämra sig när de ser människosonen komma på himlens mål med stor makt och härlighet. Med starkt basunljud ska sända ut sina änglar. Det ska samla hans utvalda från de fyra vädersträcken från himlens ena ände till den andra. Now we, we read a phrase there, all the peoples of the earth will mourn. Det står att alla uh, jordens folk ska jämra sig. And the word for earth is not cosmos. It's actually another word. And some of your margin notes, it might say tribes of the land. So if cosmos is the whole planet, Ukimene is the Roman Empire. Gi is an even smaller area. He says all the tribes of the land will mourn. That's very different than all the peoples of the earth. To say all the tribes of the land. Then we have uh, verses about him coming on clouds. And that also, um, I'm going to give you some references, but we won't look them up right now. Psalm chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. Psalm chapter 104, verses 2 and 3. Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. Noham, chapter 2, 3. 1 Samuel, chapter 19, verse 1. 1 Samuel, 19, verse 1. What you find there is that when God comes in judgment, he, the, the picture he paints is that he's riding on clouds. Bilden han målar att han kommer på rider på mål. In uh, Psalm 18, i Psalm 18, it talks about how he came in judgment upon the Egyptians. It says that he rode on a cloud of chariot, a chariot of clouds, and he threw the thunderbolts, and he released judgment on them. So when they would say that he's riding on clouds, it's a phrase they all understand from the Old Testament of him coming in judgment in a poetic 
a prophetic sense. Att han kom som ett dom i ett profetiskt poetiskt språk. I love creating content for you guys. The biggest thing that you could do as a favor back for me is to share this like crazy. If you want to keep up on it day by day, I would highly recommend that you download the phone app. And if you already have the phone app, tell somebody else to download the phone app and share this on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever, however you want to share it. 